Welcome back, everyone. I'm sure you've all heard about the different race and gender narratives going on in the country, but what a lot of people don't know is that there's a clear model with these movements that does not represent the surface narratives that they have. Now, to help us understand what's really going on with these movements and what the real goal is, including with the people who founded these movements, we invite to speak with us Mike Gonzalez. He's the author of the book, Plot to Change America, and that's how identity politics is dividing the land of the free. He's also with the Heritage Foundation. And Mike, it's a real pleasure having you on Crossroads. Thanks a lot, Josh Rice. My pleasure to be on with you. Great. So, yeah, I was reading your book. It's, 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 it, you actually touch on some really interesting angles with it. I think the big one you talk about is you really you give a framework on how to dismantle the narratives of these organizations. I think the biggest one is helping people understand that these are not grassroots movements. Uh, can you explain this to us? Yeah, sure. I, let me explain first what I mean by identity politics. I meant that identity politics is the reimagining of America as not a united country, not a nation united, but as a confederation of identity groups. And, and what matters is that some of these groups are, are considered to be oppressed. And then one of these groups are the, is the oppressor. And that, that is, you know, white males um, who, who are able bodied. Uh, in, in, in Protestant. Um, uh, but the rest are, are, are thought to be, in some ways, others, some more than others, to be oppressed and marginalized. And, and the thing about these groups, then, is that, as you said, they have been created synthetically uh, by activists, by the left, for the purpose of instilling the members of the groups with a sense of victimhood, with, with grievances, so that would act as a catalyst to change society to change America. That's why I call my, my book The Plot to Change America, not because it's a conspiracy in which people leftists in, in Madison, Wisconsin, go into a basement every Thursday night and discuss these things, but because the philosophy behind identity politics is, a, 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 is a, 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 an attempt to change society, to change the United States into something which it never was meant to be, which is communist Marxist uh, central planning. I don't know if that gives a, a, a good, you know, umbrella overview of this, but um, go ahead and ask uh, further questions. Yeah, so yeah, I want to go into a few different points with this. One, I want to talk about, of course, what the real goal of these organizations is, the ones that started this whole thing. We can go into the whole Frankfurt School issue and critical theory and how, the, you know, how this started and also understanding how they created these categories. Uh, but first, I want to talk to you, I guess, about how they convinced people they were oppressed. Because what I found interesting, and you, you show some good research on it, is that a lot of people, when they first tried starting these movements, didn't actually identify along the lines that they now identify with. Really, people these days, seeing the news and so on, we, we can forget that things weren't always like this. I, I think you made a good example, for example, with la the Latino community that that was not really an identity before a lot of this. Can, can you talk about this? Well, it, it, uh, Hispanics, which came before Latino, was created by government. It's, it's, a, it's a, a denominational label created by government. In fact, it was created uh, by the Office of Management and Budget in, in, in Policy Directive Number 15 in 1977, and then applied to the census, uh, the, the, the national census that came out in 1980, along with Asian Americans, which is a, another synthetically, you know, uh, confected identity group. Um, the, you're quite right. In fact, I have a book here. It's the report that UCLA uh, paid uh, some researchers to go into the Southwest, into parts of Texas in California. They picked quite a lot of money, UCLA did, for this report. Uh, in the late 60s, I, th I think the, the, the whole thing came out to $600,000, which is a lot back then. And the, the, this is one of the starting points of this, because the researchers came back and informed the, the Ford Foundation. Uh, it was actually the other way. It was the Ford Foundation who paid UCLA researchers to do this. The UCLA researchers came back and informed, they informed the Ford Foundation that Mexican-Americans did not feel like victims, they did not feel marginalized. They did not feel at all that they were members of a minority. Um, in fact, uh, they, they knew they faced discrimination, especially in southern Texas, 
but they thought that they had uh, individual agency, that they could solve their problems through this individual agency. Needless to say, the Ford Foundation was aghast uh, because it, it wanted, it needed a sense of victimhood uh, in these members. So the process begins then, including with his effort, to instill the sense of victimhood. Uh, this starts out from the idea best enunciated by uh, Herbert Marcuse, which is an, who is an academic, a very influential academic, member of the Frankfurt School, who said in 1966, all liberation begins with a consciousness of servitude. In other words, you have to be conscious of your servitude first, of being, a, a, of being uh, oppressed, before you can react uh, uh, about through revolution. We see this again in 2015, when the Census Bureau brings in Americans of Arab origin to create the MENA for Middle East North Africa category. The MENA category was uh, going to be modeled on the Hispanic category, which is created in 1977. Again, first starts with the Census Bureau. So the left, these activists, care a great deal about this. But if you listen to the transcript, which I have done, and I put online, and I, I, I cite from it in my book, The Plot to Change America, if you listen to the debate that they, they had at the Census Bureau in 2015, again, they repeat, <clears throat> look, the uh, Americans of Middle Eastern descent have no interest in being members of a category. Most of them want to continue to be considered white. Uh, they're, they're, they have assimilated, they're normal, you know, they're, they're mainstream, and they don't feel themselves to be marginalized. And then uh, somebody, a, 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 an ethnic studies professor in this meeting says, ah, but when they realize that they get ahead of the line for, for um, uh, school admissions, they get ahead of the line for government contracts, when they realize that there are benefits, actual benefits associated with category membership and, and, and with, with, uh, with uh, the, an official, the, the official bestowing of marginalization, they will adhere to it. So do you see the same thing happening? And in fact, at that meeting, just to close this off, at that meeting, they had people who were at the creation of Hispanics to explain how they did it in, in, the, in the 70s, to explain to people then, you know, uh, 30 years later, 40 years later, look, this is how nobody wanted Hispanics either. We created it. It stuck. This is going to happen also with people of Middle East in North African descent in the United States. Now, you hit on something interesting, which is that people had individual agency, and so they didn't want to be seen as marginalized and persecuted. And I think, I think this brings up an interesting point, is that do you want to deal with your problems yourself and not really think it's that big of a deal, which even when I was a kid was kind of how people dealt with stuff like this? Or do you want to have a government basically represent your interests. Is this where it is, this kind of issue between individual agency versus government representation? Is this, is this where it's at? It is exactly on that. Uh, and, and you hear this constantly. All of the people who propose to the proponents of this ideology today, they admit and they say, yes, you can succeed individually. You can succeed individually. But when you're doing that, you're joining the system. You're joining a bad system. Angela Davis, who's a communist and who is the, the, the biggest intellectual mentor to the, the, to the leaders of the Black Lives Matter organizations, uh, uh, Patrice Coulers, Alicia Garza, and, and Opal Tometi, she says this openly. She says, when you succeed, you and your family as individuals or as a family, you're joining the system, a system that is heteronormative, a, a system that is systemically racist, a system that, that is awful, that is capitalist, that is unfair. What we need you to do is change the system, dismantle the system, overthrow the system. In order for you to do that, you need to be upset. You need to realize that you're a victim, that the system victimizes you, and you can only you will then act, act collectively. So they don't want individual improvement. Uh, in fact, they, they, they militate against all the things that would help the individual um, uh, succeed in society, but what they want is collective action as a member of a category to then allied with government 
overthrow the system and demand a government that will think of group categories only uh, and, and act that way. In that sense, I am very concerned, and I have written a, a lot about this, about the Biden administration's stress on equity, not equality, because equity, equality means equal treatment under the law. We haven't always, we haven't always lived that way, but when we have aspired to it, we have succeeded. Equity means unequal treatment according to group category. Equity is the treatment called for under this mode of thinking that the government will dispense resources and treat people unequally depending on what category they belong. As crazy as that sounds, that is exactly why the new Biden administration is using equity all the time, why the executive order that Biden signed in his first day in office used the word equity 21 times and did not use the word equality once. And, and, and the, the poor man, poor Biden, when he misspeaks and reads it off the teleprompter wrong and uses the word equality, he backs up on himself, he corrects himself and says equity. They cannot, they cannot even use the word equality anymore. You know, you're painting an interesting picture, which is that the people advocating for these things are telling people that they need to change the system. But ironically, what you have is, you know, and this is something I've been seeing too, you have a lot of people who are convinced that they're fighting to change the system, they're fighting against the big businesses, while at the same time the people pushing them to do this typically represent the big businesses, really, you know, really if you look at the corporate sponsors for this, and typically represent the institutions and the big government. And so what, what is, how does this really work? Is it just getting them to surrender their own free will to this system? while telling them they're overthrowing the system by doing that? Or is there something more to it? Well, uh, you're touching on something that is very much part of the debate today. There is no question that the Fortune 500, that the corporate world is becoming wokeified, that woke ideology has entered uh, American corporations and companies. Uh, why that has happened, there are many explanations for that. What, what happened on campus, the takeover of critical race theory on campus, was not going to stay on campus. These people graduate. And once once administrators, not just nutty professors, but once school administrators begin to dispense university policy according to group membership and according to grievances and all that, the student learns that that's how the world works. And when he enters, when she enters the corporate world, they demand that corporations behave in this manner. Uh, the left has also taken over the corporate world through HR. Uh, pharma has played a role in this. Um, the, uh, in, in, in what some people, some of the some of the left says that they have to make sure that this corporate co-optation of, of woke ideology is not just lip service, that it is real, that is going to transform society, that the corporate world really wants to transform society. Um, I think that a lot of what you see with the corporate uh, corporate giving to Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter organizations, is a, is, is a lot of virtue signaling as well. But I have to tell you that after I and others began to spread the, 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 the news last year uh, that, um, that, that the Black Lives Matter organization, the concept is, is unimpeachable. If, if you don't think Black Lives Matter, I don't want to talk to you because, you know, you, you're, you're a nut. But the organizations that go under that name are, are Marxists, and they, they don't, they're demonstrably Marxist. The leaders are demonstrably Marxist. And we started picking up a very, a very real uh, pullback by in corporate giving to the Black Lives Matter organizations, uh, whereas it was very much, it was something that, that was happening in June and July. By the time we got to August and September, even the Business Roundtable was beginning to quietly move that money away from the Black Lives Matter organizations into other social justice, uh, which can be some of them quite bad as well. But there is a little bit of discernment at, in the corporate world as to what the Black Lives Matter organizations, and by that I mean the global um, the, the global Net network foundation and the, the movement for Black Lives. These are organizations that are by definition, quite Marxist, I, it appears that corporate giving to them has dried up a little bit. Foundations do continue to give to them. Now, 
We, of course, see the surface issues. We see the Democratic Party now talking about equity. I think a lot of our viewers understand that you know, this is basically saying no matter how much effort you put in, you have the same outcome, and that the, out, the equal outcome rather than the opportunity to try to achieve things is then equalized. And so right. individual effort no longer really means as much. We, we see this surface stuff happening, but I wanna, what I want to talk to you about is why this is happening. And, and, I, and I, I know you've researched a lot of the foundational discussions that led to a lot of this. Now, I think we can start, we can start with the Frankfurt School, which you mentioned, and the idea, maybe we can start with critical race theory or critical theory in this case. You know, what was critical theory and what was the real thinking behind the creation of this? So I have a lot of books. I, I have here the history of, of the Frankfurt School in critical theory by Martin Jay, an American academic who is quite sympathetic to the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School was basically the first uh, outpouring of, of neo-Marxism, of, of Western Marxism, after the founding of the Soviet Union in, in 1917 and the, 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 the failure of the, of the creation of a German Soviet in 1919, that revolution failed, and German, uh, German Marxists began to wonder why. Why was the, the, the proletariat not rising up and overthrowing the bourgeois overlords? And they said, well, it's because <clears throat> the proletariat has accepted all the givens of, 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 the, of, the, of the oppressors, they has accepted religion, has accepted the, 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 the economic model, capitalism, accepted the family, the patriarchal family, so it has accepted everything. We need to, in, we need to approach the, the, the worker not only as a, not, not just as an economic class, but culturally, get them to stop accepting the nation state, the church, the family, and the capitalist system, change their mind through struggle sessions. So then the Frankfurt School comes up with critical theory in 1937 in an essay by the director um, of, the, of the school, uh, Max Horkheimer. And he says critical, th critical theory pretty much is, is a, a, an intense, unrelenting criticism of all these institutions of the West, the family, the church, in order to tear them down, to make them easier to tear down and to replace them with the things that the Marxists want. Critical race theory is an, it's an outgrowth of this. First, we have critical legal theory, which is, comes up in the American universities in the 1970s. And, and it's, 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 it pretends that, again, the law is used by the writers of the law um, to protect their, their oppressor status, to protect their property, to protect their way of life. And that the law, as it's written, the statutes do not protect the oppressed. From that, we get critical race theory, uh, which begins with the, uh, Derek Bell at Harvard, who was Barack Obama's favorite professor, by the way, and in, 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 in uh, um, uh, Richard Delgado, Gene Stefansek, um, uh, I think Angela Harris as well, Kimberly Crenshaw, who begin this, 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 this philosophy, really, that looks at all, all of American life through the prism of race and thinks that all, the, all of these all of the racial dynamics are, are oppressive, that everything in America is, that America is systemically racist and structurally racist and institutionally racist, so we must change all the institutions, all the structures, and the very system. That is the philosophy, it is a Marxist philosophy from the beginning, and it, it's really the philosophy uh, behind the Black Lives Matter organizations, the 1619 Project, and all the woke culture that we see today. Well, and this is interesting because if we go back to Marxism, really, you know, one of the ideas of early communist revolutions was convincing people there were two segments of society, the bourgeois and the proletariat, right. the oppressors and the oppressed. Right. And really the, the narrative was you need to give us power to represent you, to destroy the oppressors, and then you end up creating a totalitarian system by people handing over this power to them, which then goes and persecutes different segments of society. And right. then, you know, we've seen how that turns out. And it seems that critical race theory and critical theory basically takes that same bourgeois proletariat dichotomy and just applies it to every social interaction, whether it's race or gender or children? Is, it, is, this, is this an accurate description of this? Oh, it's, it's like, it's as though you've read my books. 
Uh, yeah, that's the reason it's no longer called economic Marxism. It's called m cultural Marxism. Uh, Antonio Gramsci, the founder of the Italian Communist Party and one of the leading thinkers in this vein, uh, was thrown into prison by Mussolini in, in, in the late 20s. So his brain would stop working. Big mistake. You do a lot of good thinking in prison. So Gramsci began to realize that, hey, the worker is not a good um, a revolutionary race. That because we, he needs to be instructed. And then that evolves into Marcuse noticing that the, 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 the riots in America, the many, many riots we had in America between 1965 and 1971, and saying he also agreed that the American worker was never going to overthrow the system. The American worker was too contented, too happy. Capitalism had worked, worked out too well for him. Uh, but actually, people of different races and colors, Marcuse says, they will be the revolutionary base that can be instructed by us, the, 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 the vanguard, the intellectual vanguard. This is all very top down. Leninism is all very top down. You must have an intellectual vanguard that instructs the potential revolutionary base into their oppression, into their servitude, and then they will be, they will rise up and overthrow the, the oppressive system. Uh, so that is exactly why we have this transference, this transition from the economic Marxism of Marx and Engels to the cultural Marxism of Gramsci, Marcuse, Angelo Davis, and so forth, Derek Bell, and so forth. And so it seems like what the case is then is that these organizations are kind of using people to destroy the parts of the institutions that they don't like. In other words, basically launching a Marxist revolution to overthrow some of the system while maintaining the parts of the system that represent their own political interests. Is, is this accurate? Well, or how does this work? I don't see it that way. I, I think that what we're seeing is exactly it's, a, it's an overthrow, but it's still the entire system. This is what we're seeing in America today. Whether it will succeed or not, I don't know. But it is an attempt to overthrow. And, and the people saying this, they don't hide it. They say, we need to change the entire system. The entire system is sexist, is racist, is heteronormative, is, is, is unfair. Capitalism picks, uh, produces winners and losers winners and losers that are now based on the traits that we think are valuable. Uh, so they, what they want, they see themselves as, as, as playing a leading role in the new system that will emerge, but it's not just a part of the system they want to overthrow. They want to overthrow all the institutions. They believe they, they, they are at the same time, they're nihilistic and utopian. Uh, they believe in the perfectibility of man, which is the reason why communism was always, always, always ending coercion, because man is not perfectible. Man is flawed. We're flawed. We need, we have, you know, we have many vices. We, we need a system that understands all that and that works without coercion to get us to a good place, to get the greatest good for the, for the, uh, the greatest number, which is what I think capitalism does and the Enlightenment does. And Adam Smith, you know, with his famous phrase, is not from the from the nobility of the baker, the butcher, uh, that we get our bread or, or, or our beer, uh, but it is from his understanding of his own self-interest. Capitalism and democracy use personal self-interest to produce a common good. This is interesting. What is, what is the end game for these movements? You talked about the Census Bureau and the recording of their actual discussion in terms of how they created racial categories for some of these purposes. You right. talked about... Uh, you know, Antonio Gramsci talked about the Frankfurt School and Herbert Marcuse and those guys who were there forming these ideas. What was the, what have you seen in terms of their actual statements that their real, not, not the surface narratives, but the real goals they had with doing this? Well, they're very open. They're, they're very open about what they want to do. This is, I'm, I use in my books mostly leftist sources, uh, not conservative sources. I, I, I urge anybody to go to the website of the movement for black the movement for black lives or the, the black lives matter just type black, black lives matter .com, read the about uh go back and look at the con the comments that alicia garza has made throughout the years her associations uh look at what uh, uh, patrice colores has said in her book uh when they call you a terrorist um the foreword was written by angelo davis you know at one time the candidate for vice president for the american communist party uh, who remains an unrepentant communist, who received the Lenin Peace Prize uh, from the East German government, uh, one of the most repressive states of, uh, behind the Iron Curtain. 
1979, she received this prize. She writes the foreword for Patrice Cullors' book. Uh, the, 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 the book has a dedication to Asata Shakur, who is Joan uh, Chesimard, who is hiding in Cuba because she's a cop killer. And she's on the, on the, on the FBI's top 10 list. This is who, who Patrice Cullors, you know, the, 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 the head of Black Lives Matter today, of the Black Lives Matter Global uh, Network Foundation, this is who she is. She doesn't hide it, and nor should we. Uh, and I think, actually, I, I prefer when people are honest. Uh, so you go to what Robin DeAngelo says, or Ibram X. Kendi, also a critical race theorist. They say capitalism is not good, that we cannot have racial equality with capitalism. By, by, by equality, they mean blocks, not individuals doing well. They mean the, the racial categories or the, the ethnic or identity categories they have created, you know, a, having a numerical uh, proportionalism in all aspects of society. They no longer look at the individual as an individual. The, the, the main actor now is the category, the, the identity category. And so, and so it seems essentially what they're doing is, is they're creating these categories using narratives or enticement of interest, like you know, better access to schools and so on, to entice people to be willing to sacrifice individual agency for the benefits of basically falling in line with those categories and then using this. Um, but there's also the, you know, the creation of resentment, the creation and use of resentment based on that, which becomes kind of the you know, the, the way that they manipulate that category for different purposes. Now, why do they do this? Why do they create resentment? Because of what Marcuse said, that all liberation needs a, a, a consciousness of servitude. I, 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 some, I often quote Maria Teresa Kumar, the, the, the head of Voto Latino, one of these groups. She actually said, and I quote her in the Wall Street Journal last year, she actually said that her problem at Voto Latino is that her constituents did not understand the oppressive system that they lived under. And that she had to explain, that Voto Latino had to explain to, to immigrants from Latin America and their children how awful the American system was. And once they understood it, yes, they decided to act and unite and act, act collectively. So you have to, what is being done then is that you're taking people who have immigrated here for a better life, who all of a sudden got up one day in Montevideo, Uruguay, or in Guerrero, Mexico, and said, this system is not working for me or my children. I want to immigrate to the United States where my children can have liberty and, and economic uh, success. And you have to indoctrinate them into why that is a big lie. And this system needs to be changed root and branch. That is not good work. <laughs> That, but it's done with a purpose that we have been discussing, to overthrow the system. Now, I think a lot of people would recognize that, you know, there are flaws in society. And, you know, it's interesting if you dig into the history of this, that one thing capitalism does, and if you look at, like, you know, uh, guys like Ludwig von Mises and uh, Austrian School of Economics, they actually talk about the need for the possibility of failure as part of the feedback system to understand what doesn't work and what does work, that things that don't work fail, and things that do work benefit and prosper, and, and really only things that benefit society and that have demand can function right. because right. failure is possible. What communism tries to do is eliminate the possibility of failure, but by doing that, they institutionalize failure and finance right. it through state subsidies. And so you have basically a, a zombie system, like in China they have what they actually call zombie factories that don't draw profits, don't you know, barely, barely function, don't benefit the society, but are maintained as just essentially, you know, mindless systems that just trudge forward. Now, I think when people see this stuff, they feel hopeless. They, they don't know what they can do about it. They feel that the institutions against them are too broad. They feel that if they speak out, they're going to get attacked. You know, what is, what is the way out with this? <laughs> Solutions are the hardest thing. First of <laughs> all, uh, Joshua, you're absolutely right. Communism is perfect at only one thing. It has a perfect record of failure. It has failed everywhere. Every culture, whether it's German culture or Cuban culture or Chinese culture or 
or, or, or uh, uh, Congolese culture, communism has failed everyone of all colors and of, and of all cultures. Why is that? Because it is a vain attempt at making man perfectible, right? They, they, it believes in, in the new man. Che Guevara is a noble hombre, you know. But, uh, but the thing is, though, if you read the if you read texts that were written thousands of years ago, like the Bible or the Iliad, uh, people depicted there thousands of years ago, like Sarah, uh, uh, Abraham, Agamemnon, Helen, did just like you and me. They have the same vices. They have the same foibles. They have the same weaknesses. And the same, and, and, and aspire to the same virtues as you and me. Freedom works with that. Freedom works with that, in, but that, that that flaw, the flaw that we all have, and tries to create a, 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 the greater good for everybody. How do we solve our way out of it? We have to look at each individual way that this is happening. You have to develop a matrix. You take a look at cancel culture, in in, in Biden using only equity. In, in the spread of critical race theory in our schools, in, in critical race theory trainings that are taking place in workplaces, and create individual reactions to that. For example, with cancel culture, maybe you have these drives to have people fired and canceled from society and have their, their livelihood taken away because they because somebody said something at one point that, that seven years later somebody else finds offensive. Well, you can have counter drives. If they have a list of 100, you know, rational people, people who care about enlightenment values can have a list of a thousand saying, no, no, Steven Pinker should not be fired by Harvard. He's, by the way, I don't agree with anything, with a lot of things that Pinker says. I agree with him on, on, on his, his, his affection for liberal values, you know, for natural rights. And for that, he's, there's, a, there's a mob out there trying to cancel him. Have a counter a drive um, with schools. Let's try to have. Let's try to say no. You cannot use taxpayer money to 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 have critical race theory trainings or or, or, or any of the any of these diversity and inclusion and equity uh, trainings that are nothing but a replication of the Maoist struggle sessions of the Cultural Revolution. You know, in order to change people's thinking and behaviors and habits. Um, so. I think the approach needs to be all of the above, uh, but society can, we can fight back. Speak, first of all, uh, learn about this stuff. Read my book, The Plot to Change America, oh, yeah. uh, but read, yeah. read everything that's out there um, <laughs> uh, and, and, and immerse yourself in the meaning of these things. Read the left too. I read the left all the time so I can write my books uh, and, and find out what they're saying. Yeah, well, Gonzalez just said that Black Lives Matter says this. I'm going to go on their website and find out what actually they're saying. That do that, and, and then you can speak rationally to your neighbors, to your friends, to your fa to, to your family. There are many things we can do. Great, Mike Gonzalez. Real pleasure having you on Crossroads. Thank you. Thank you. The pleasure was all mine.